Welcome back YouTubers to another Q&A with us, the guys wearing the same clothes as the last Q&A and we'll be wearing the same clothes in the next Q&A because we record these three at a time. It's your none other than your boys, the British Fist. Catching! And sitting here wonderfully is me Mr Parkin and sitting next to me quite inquisitively don't you think ladies, it's none other than NJ. What's up? And we're going to be giving you another Q&A today as long as you subscribe or above, like this video and comment any thoughts or questions you have down in that comment section down there. Make sure you contact us in the link in the picture box below. Yeah, and we've, again, like I said, I know I say this a lot, but we've had an overwhelming amount of questions. We're going to try and get through them as quickly as possible. And uh, even though Andrew looked like he was giving birth there a little bit, <laughs> yeah, make sure you come, make sure you give us, keep, keep sending us in your questions, whether it be through inboxing, commenting down below, or through our Facebook, facebook.com forward slash British Fist. There are many methods you can get, to, you can choose to get to us. And as NJ said, they're all in that description box down there. And we have more questions coming in, so thank you very much, people. <laughs> Breaking news, more questions coming in. Yes. Are we going to start with Purple Purple 1405? Was that the breaking news? Purple Purple 1405 asked us five questions, the first of which is probably going to get a lot of time. What are your takes on the Benoit and Owen incident? We'll go straight to you first, NJ, on the, on the Chris Benoit incident. Thank you very much. With Chris Benoit, he's a wrestler that I'm definitely going to remember because he did put on a lot of great effort, a lot of great work, great matches, great moments, and his career did build up in a way that we cannot bash. He started from the bottom, climbed his way up, went through factions, feuds, and that, got to the world title, and just, that was great. But, obviously, with his death and the way he, it's been in the news, bang out there, the fans who have supported him and liked him. It, in some way, it hasn't had an effect on them, but also it's had an effect on the WWE, where they've got to a place where they cannot mention it. It's sad, but I can see why they do it. And me personally, I feel that Chris Benoit, even though his death was done in a way that people will probably see him differently, I still think he should be respected and mentioned by the WWE. I also feel the same way. I think he should definitely be respected for what he did in the WWE, but there's no way you can just eliminate what he did from memory in the sense that, you know, he killed his he killed his wife, he killed his son, and then he killed himself. And it's the reason right now why we have the wellness policy. And if you remember in the last Q&A, me and NJ had some very strong thoughts on the wellness policy, kind of, kind of holding WWE back a little bit. So you could blame Benoit in the sense that he did bring it, he, he was the person that was, you know, had to, that made WWE bring in the wellness policy. Thanks, Chris Benoit. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And the Owen incident, well, the big question in the Owen incident was when he fell to his death in 1997 at Over the Edge, should the pay view continue? Now, I think you've got, it's very difficult because if you're Vincent Mann, you're thinking that you're looking at it as a businessman, generally the concept is, you know, it must go on. Do you think they should have continued the pay per view or do you think they should have respected Owen's death and stopped it or done something else around it? I can see either way and I think you guys could have an interesting discussion in the comments section about this, really. I think it's a big discussion because that happened, Benoit was after the match, after the yeah. pay per view, blah, 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 and Owen having drawing. What I would have done is worked around it just so that the money period paid but still got the money worth mm -hmm. and then probably has it at the end of the show to explain the situation just so people were aware. But overall, both deaths were very tragic for the WWF, WWE. And both had effects on the business as well. So we move on to our next question. Uh, question number two. Would you consider Jericho's return a success since he hasn't won any pay-per-view? I get winning isn't everything, but in my opinion, he is a glorified jobber. Um, there is definitely a valid point for that because Jericho was brought in and we thought he was going to be a big player in WWE. And he has put guys over... But not, in my opinion, in a big way, which is kind of which is what we expected from Jericho, in my opinion. Okay, I'm going to try to say, say this with a straight face because with Jericho coming in, a big name, a guy we were all waiting for, came in and did the right thing, which was put a guy over. But the whole view, apart from Jericho's promos, was all about punk. And now he's moving on, and I wanted him to go against Shane to do the same thing, but instead he's going to this Money in the Bank match where he's probably do the same. To give like be a bidder to put on a great money in, the, money in the bank match for someone else. So in a way, I think it's pretty sad that his return isn't as for him as it could have been to progress his uh, time in the WWE. I think the big question here is more in the sense that should WWE have used him a lot better, or if he was only going to be in there temporarily, should they have just used him to put over talent? I mean, that's something, again, that we could, have, could spark interesting discussion in the comment section. I'll just say that. Question number three. Where do you see TNA in 10 years as a whole and compared to WWE? 
I'll go straight to you on this one. Ten years from now, well, they are slowly making improvements. Yes, their ratings are not showing it, but I think in ten years' time, once they somehow get their name out there more with the good stuff they're doing, maybe their ratings will be not as high as the WWE's, but more high than where they're at now, and hopefully their shows and their ratings will improve. I'd hope that in 10 years' time, TNA will be in a position where they can at least put doubt in Vincent Mann's eyes, whoever's taken over the company at the time, probably Triple H. It would be nice to see TNA in 10 years' time to be able to get into maybe the two ratings, or maybe they've got, they'll be in a position where they can sort of you know, really scare WWE a little bit, so at least the business as a whole can improve. I'd like to see TNA being as big as WCW. Do I think it could happen? I'd like to see it happen. Do I think it will? Probably not. I think TNA, if the business stays like it is right now, it'll always be an alternative rather than a uh, competition to WWE, unfortunately. Uh, question four. What are your thoughts on the main event of WrestleMania 29 possibly being Rock versus Brock when neither of them are full-time wrestlers and are leaving after WrestleMania 29, especially since it might be four weeks, for, since it might be for the WWE title? It's a very interesting point, isn't it? None of them are full-time guys. It's for the WWE title. It's, I mean, it is. I mean, I don't think it will be for the WWE title, but it's definitely an interesting question. And that's the thing with it being at WrestleMania, the biggest stage of them all. The WWE do want drawing matches, matches that fans are going to pay to want to see. And with these two wrestlers, if Brock's booking gets better and The Rock makes an appearance soon, maybe they can start building up to it after SummerSlam. But in my eyes, my opinion from this point right now, before Money in the Bank, I don't want to see it. No, I think the thing is here, you want draws to your to the WrestleMania pay-view, and that is understandable. Rock versus Brock would be a draw. But in the sense, you also have to focus on your future. And you also have to focus on, you know, who's going to be stars and the matches that you're going to put against these people that could possibly make new stars in WWE. Rock and Lesnar are only going to be there temporarily. So you'd think they'd be there to create draws and also to maybe help talent get over a little bit more. That's why I'm not a massive fan of Brock versus Rock happening. I think they should have Brock Lesnar go after the streak, and I also think they should have Rock maybe go against a CM Punk or a big star in WWE or a guy who WWE, I think, I'm thinking of making a bigger star. That's how I think they should do it, in my opinion. Because that's the case with it being their, probably their last year of being a part of the WWE. They both should do something that's going to help the future of the WWE for that year and onwards. Yeah. So Brock Lesnar versus a younger wrestler, The Rock versus a younger wrestler, that's just the way I would put this. And me too. We're both pretty much in agreement on that one. Uh, it's just our philosophy. Um... And the last question, your thoughts on Christian being seriously underused? He's the only veteran in the WWE that deserves to be in the main event that isn't one. Do you think it has anything to do with him going to TNA and your thoughts on the chances of him getting a long world title run? There, there is some truth to that. Christian was in TNA and we all know WWE, especially Mr. Man, doesn't really like to push guys that were in TNA. I don't think Christian will ever get a long world title run because I don't think he's got that look of a guy that can run for a long time with the title. I think that is the main reason. That's true, and even though he's a guy that's been built up correctly through the mid-card, the tag teams, and up to the main event, and he's got a crowd base behind him, I don't think he's big enough or in the right direction to be a long-term World Heavyweight Champion. Look at his past title runs, and I think now he should be where he is now. He's had a time in the main event, but now he's in the mid-card, and hopefully going to be a good person to put other talents over, as well as be a strong champion there. And you raised an interesting point there. You, I mean, people could argue Christian is underused, but Christian's ability has always been he is unselfish, he will help put young heels over. So in that sense, he's not being underused. He really isn't. He's being used, I think, in the best way that I think a guy like Christian could be used, because I don't really see him in the main event. I see him as this upper mid-card guy to put over up-and-coming heels, like maybe Miz or Ziggler or just Sandow or just some up-and-coming heels, maybe Daniel Bryan, who knows? Um, Green... <laughs> Greeny Awesome As Fuck. I love that because my favourite band is Green Day and their, their last live album was called Awesome As Fuck, so I do get that one. Ask us two questions. Do you think Kane and Undertaker will ever have a match again? Not with Undertaker being a, a very, very, you know, slight a, a WrestleMania attraction. I don't think Kane versus Taker number three is big enough for WrestleMania, so I would have to say no. With me personally, if Taker does somehow have another two more WrestleManias in him, I do see it being probably one more chance if they can book it correctly. But the way I see it, Taker is getting to a place where even though fans don't want to admit it, he could retire any time and his last one. They've all they've got a treat every WrestleMania now as Taker's last one in yep. case it finishes. So no. 
do you think Jeff Hardy will ever return to WWE? Well, not while they got the wellness policy going. That's why RBD hasn't gone back to WWE yet. Very, that, very true. That is why Orton got suspended. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Orton. Now, with uh, uh, Jeff Hardy, he did say he'll make a return. He made that big promise, but he's not a man of his word in this case because I think he's settled in TNA. TNA are offering him direction and what he wants and a good monthly money, uh, money paycheck. So I think he will stay there. Yeah, I, I don't see why WWE would want him, to be honest, with the whole wellness policy. How could they trust him with that wellness policy going around? It's too strict for a guy like Jeff Hardy. Um, TR3, the truth. The truth shall set you free. Asked us a very interesting one. Well, this is going to spark a lot of comedy. Who do you think had the most, had, right, the top five most forgettable WWE Championship reigns in WWE Championship history? Um, we got a couple. Del Rio, uh, Del Rio's short title reign. When he, when he won the title of SummerSlam and then dropped it to John Cena, that was just forgettable. Dropped it to who? John Cena. Surprise, surprise. Rey Mysterio holding it for about a week and then next week winning it, losing it to none other than John Cena. <laughs> the thing is, with this particular <laughs> night, they were trying to build this tournament sort of thing to get you champion. I think it was on the same night it even happened. The main event was... It was the week after, wasn't it? The, Rey Mysterio beat The Miz... And then, and then next week, um, they they tra they made Ray the champion in the opener, and then made Cena win the title. Oh, the yeah. So they could have Punk versus John Cena at SummerSlam. Even though they never should have brought CM Punk back. It's really ridiculous. <laughs> With Ray Mysterio, he's a guy that fans do like and want to get behind, but they just messed his tar reign up there, and Ray Mysterio, I'm sure, wasn't happy with that. Dolph Ziggler's 20-minute reign, do you remember that? It's like, oh, we're going to give the belt to Dolph Ziggler and then straight back to Edge later that night. No, no, I don't remember that, no. Exactly, and why would we? WWE never mentioned the fact that they ever won it. Jack Swagger, that was ridiculously forgettable. He held it for some time, but not enough for the fans to say he's a great champion, not at all. Great Carly. Does anyone ever remember his title reigns for anything other than the fact that he's botched and he held the title upside down every time he held it? That and other than he faced Triple H. Oh, <laughs> yes, who kicked his ass. SummerSlam, what was that? SummerSlam 2009 or something? Or 7? I can't remember. I can't remember. That's how bad it was. I don't even remember when they had that match. But, oh, Bob Backlund is another one. He beat, what was it? He beat Bret Hart for it in the 90s and then lost it to Kevin Nash at a house show a couple of days later in eight seconds and he didn't even know he was losing it. So what the fuck? <laughs> There are some pretty bad, like, even like you could say Kane's one day title reign when he won it in the first blood match and then lost it to Austin again on Raw in 98. That was just awesomeness. You don't count for one. What you do count is the flipping title reign that kept changing between Cena and Edge or anyone that keeps dropping the title in a short amount of time. Thanks for that, WWE. <laughs> do you think WWE is somewhat unfair to their black wrestlers? I'm a young black man myself and I love the WWE, but I just wish they would. I just wish there were some dominant black wrestlers in the main event scene. To me, WWE missed out on many opportunities with guys like Bobby Lashley, Kobe Kingston, and our truth What do you guys think? Good, good, good point, good point, good point. Because we have had black wrestlers who you could say, yes, oh, he'll be a main eventer. Mm -hmm. He can actually hold the belt. I would like to see that. They did that temporarily with Lashley, but with the wrong belt, ECW. So I think there are wrestlers there you could see with one of the main WWE top belts around their waist, but the WWE's fairness to them isn't where it should be, but where it should be. It is a shame Vincent Mann is, uh, to say the least, a bit of a racist. Um, and to be honest with you, a lot of these black talents like Kobe Kingston, like he got his run stopped by Randy Orton. R-Truth was another guy who could have been in the main event, but you just knew WWE were never going to go there because Vincent Mann doesn't really like black wrestlers that much. And that is a massive shame because there have been a lot of good black talents. Like Mark Henry won the World Heavyweight Championship. Great World Heavyweight Championship reign. The Rock won a championship, you know. There are two black guys there that won championships that were good. And that's the thing, if they can follow on with that Mark Henry being the champion and give it to another champion, even though they're not really booking the black wrestlers <laughs> as well as the white ones, that was pretty sad. I wouldn't mind seeing it again, not at all. I rod 4545. Number one out of three. Do you think WWE should drop drop SmackDown so they can do a better job concentrating on their three hour raw? No, I think they should have Raw two hours and SmackDown as an equally important brand for two hours as well, not drop it at all. Well, I've got the shivers there because of this question, even though SmackDown is the B show and failing in many ways, it is still a show they can add stuff on to build up to and have something separate from Raw. So in a way, they should keep both shows, but make the booking better on both. Indeed, make them booking equal so they're That's equal it. shows. Um, 
Question two, and I think this question was asked before the primetime players thing, so we'll acknowledge that. What the hell happened to AW and his crew? I haven't seen anything from them in weeks. Did WWE give up on the gimmick? This was before the primetime players thing, and we didn't see Abraham Washington or Epic and Primo on TV for like a month, and you were actually at the point thinking, are they actually going to do anything for him? But obviously, he's now with the primetime players, but at the point, you were thinking, they introduced, they introduced Abraham Washington, and they're not doing anything with the guy. No, with Avon Washington being a figure that people could look up to in some way, especially the younger talent, because we had Mason Ryan there, that guys that we want to see more involved, but obviously the WWE killed that off and concentrated just on the tag team, which is not a bad thing, because the tag team do need some kind of push or some kind of build to help them, but he did have a faction there that could have actually done something for the future of younger stars. And now him with the primetime players, in my opinion, was a very good move, and that's my opinion. Um, do you think Miz could benefit from a face turn? Well, he's playing a hero in Marine, so if they market the Marine, they could turn him into a babyface. Do you think he could benefit from it? I mean, he can't be booked any worse as a babyface, could he? No, he's a strong heel, great mic work as a heel, as a face. I can see him using that strong mic work as a face, mm. but it's just how the fans would see him, because they're so used to seeing him as a heel and yeah, liking it. We have to see if they ever do turn in phase, what they would do differently to make his character still work. Yep, and he is a natural heel, so people want to boo him. You can't really help that, really. Um, the last set of questions comes from Liberty Bell. That sounds like a, that sounds like a really pretty name. I just want to say that right now. How long do you figure the Big Slugs heel turn will last? I'm guessing you're talking about uh, Big Show there. The heel turn is heel turn. Well, he's a character that the fan, the WWE know he can work as a heel and a face, so they think. If we ever need to do it to make a few rivalry work, just use Big Show. But the thing is, in my eyes, from his career as he went on, yes, he's had some good stuff as a face. He's always been a better heel. Yes. But the question is, how long will it last? Yeah. I think they want to keep him as a heel, but without Laurinaitis there, he's not really got someone to help him give, keep him as a heel. So if they want to turn him face, it'll happen any time. He's had his main event slot now. He'll probably be turned babyface again in a year because he seems to do it every year with Big Show, but he has a much better heel. That's all I will say on that one. Uh, will Orton go to TNA if he's fired or leaves WWE? Do you think TNA could pay him enough? Do you think he would want to be part of TNA? Well, if the WWE ever did say, that's it, you're screw up, stop doing all your drug stuff and go somewhere else, yeah, they'll say that. I still think he's going to have to go somewhere because most of his life, apart from his Marine stuff, yeah. yeah, he has been involved with wrestling, so maybe he will switch to TNA, but not want to, because obviously the WWE are paying him more, which is what Autumn was all about. Yeah, I, I can't ever see him going to TNA. I think, to be honest, he's got enough money to set himself up for life, so he doesn't really need to, but that's just, who really knows, only Autumn could tell us that, and he isn't watching these videos, because he ain't putting anyone over. When will the two brands, when will the two brands untie and just either be Raw or SmackDown? Or just become WWE wrestling or something along those lines. Do you think they will just like get rid of that? I don't see them getting rid of the two shows, though. That's the thing. The WWE going back to being an overall wrestler everywhere thing. They're already doing that now, but to make it permanent, make it so they are actually doing it. In the future, they may swerve back round to that just for the sake of doing something different or trying some different ideas out. But right now, the WWE hopefully making money from doing it separately. Yeah, and it, it, there's no point in having Raw and SmackDown. Uh, just There's no point in combining the two. You might as well just have Raw and SmackDown, even if it does go three hours. There's two separate brands. They can tour them in two separate places. So it would make business sense to keep the two around. I, I don't know. I'm just... Yeah. Um, I still despise Michael Cole. You guys, question mark. NJ, go. Michael Cole, he is becoming a commentator that stands out. You hear him. He actually brings out the side of the commentary that you want to bash, hate, talk about. But when he comes to in-ring, using him as a wrestler, he really fails, and that's when the despise grows from down here, straight up to here. Can I have your attention, please? I've just received a text from the anonymous British Fist General Manager. Oh, interesting. No. That was a simple answer, wasn't it, NJ? Pretty simple indeed. I don't, I don't despise Mark Cole as a character. You're supposed to. I kind of find the character entertaining sometimes, but when they put him in those match situations, like you said, kind of fails. He's, he's a lot better than what he used to be. 
Yes, and we'll end the Q&A there on that very, very negative note, but there we go. You have been hearing questionnaire. Questionnaire? No, that will be us filling in questions. We've been answering your questions. I've been Mr. Parkin. This guy has been NJ. What's up? Because I know how much you love to see that. Put any thoughts or comments you have on the question you've answered down in that comment section below. And if you've been watching the whole thing, then you get to see NJ do this. Thank you very much, people. This has been a video that is worth watching. Please keep the questions coming. I've got Miss Parkin and me, NJ. Goodbye.